Welcome to module one of the Open Science MOOC. Before we start, we just want to give a little bit of background behind what this module is about, all about. So did you know that the internet and the World Wide Web were both actually originally designed for research purposes? Researchers themselves wanted a fast, easy and low cost way for sharing data with each other and hence the internet was born. Now the internet dominates almost every aspect of our daily lives and yet it somehow seems to have deviated from this original purpose. Researcher actually seems to have almost gone backwards compared to almost every other enterprise which affects our lives. For us, and for many others, open science can be seen as the movement to help bring modern research back into line with this original intent, while also reasserting fundamental scientific practices back into the endeavour. Did you know that like access to, to knowledge is so important that it's even embedded within the UN Declaration on Human Rights? If you look at one of the articles there, it says that everyone has the right to freely participate in the cultural life of the community, to enjoy the arts, and to share in scientific advancement and its benefits. Another point says, everyone has the right to the protection of the moral and material interests resulting from any scientific, literary, or artistic production of which he is the author. So this is pretty important, you know, if it's in the UN Declaration on Human Rights, you think that science is kind of important. But you've probably landed here because you've got a bit of a nagging feeling that something about the way modern research is conducted and shared isn't quite right. So the whole purpose of this module is to hopefully shed some light on those feelings and to help you understand the state of the present system and its discord within intrinsic human and scientific values and principles. Hopefully this is the start of your own journey to become even more of an awesome researcher as well as a champion in your own field in the practices of open research. Hopefully by being here we can all work together to help to empower individuals and communities to make real changes to research cultures that we haven't even imagined or dreamed of yet. So with that out of the way, uh, welcome to module one of the Open Science MOOC all about open principles. This is the first of 10 core modules to give you a solid grounding in all things open science and is perhaps the best introductory module to the Open Science MOOC overall. Um, the content itself has been developed as always through the in the open through collaboration with an international team of open science wizards. Um, and just to sort of get started, so did you know that you are in the middle of a profound and global scientific revolution? Um, to innovate in a field frequently implies moving against prevailing trends, structures, and cultural inertia. And what we call open science is no different. The fact that you, you, are here reading this now means that you probably have an interest in the impact that open science can have on improving research cultures. And we get, like we mentioned before, notice that something's not quite right about, you know, what we might call the status quo in modern research. So the purpose of this module is to introduce you to the guiding principles, values, and practices of open science, as well as some of the potential barriers to these and the overall positive impact that integrating openness into your daily research can have on you. So just to sort of like caveat this, this module is not designed to be a one size fits all approach, but rather a foundational plan that helps to incorporate questions around the varying and dynamic sort of dimensions, interpretations, and goals of open science across different communities. This module itself is designed primarily for students and researchers at the graduate or undergraduate level, um, and it can serve as a training material for postdocs and senior researchers too, if, um, if they wish. What we want with this is to help make openness universal and for all, and not just a select few. So this aims to be a very, very, very cross-disciplinary module covering all research branches, um, including as far as like engineering, medicine, the biosciences, mathematics, social sciences, humanities, and the arts. What we've done through development here is try to set a highly inclusive standard. And right from the beginning of just the ideas behind this MOOC, um, we've had people from across the entire research spectrum of scholarly research and related disciplines trying to help us with this, you know, from, from the tech industry, from publishing, librarianship, and all research disciplines have helped to uh, be involved with developing and scoping this project. Um, as a result of this, we use the term open science, given that this seems to be a phrase that global changes are sort of coalescing around at the moment. But we also recognize that terms such as open research or open scholarship, although perhaps less widely used at the moment, might help to capture a bit more what our intention is here. But what we want to make clear is that irrespective of your background, um, you are very much welcome within, the, within this MOOC. 
the specific learning objectives for this module are fairly simple actually. So the first one is simply to understand the ethical, legal, social, economic, philosophical and research impact arguments both for and against open science. We do, And using this knowledge we'll also then go on to develop a new skill set around setting up a personal profile for developing and defining your research impact such as measuring the social and academic attention for the full range of your research processes and outputs. So with all of this in mind, what actually is open science? Well, the term open science actually does not have a universally accepted definition at the moment, but it usually refers to sort of one core theme, and that's around increasing knowledge availability as a public good. Now, typically, this comes with critical research principles such as credibility, reproducibility, and verifiability included in some sort of combination. Um, but like we mentioned before, many other terms are being used sort of synonymously with open science, including things like open research, open scholarship, or science 2.0, and even e-science. So throughout this MOOC and this, uh, this module, what we want to just make clear is that we consider open science to be fully inclusive of all of these terms, um, all scholarly research disciplines, and to reflect the wider process of organized knowledge creation. Um, ironically, if you want to read the only currently peer-reviewed research article to try and systematically attempt to define uh, open science, it's actually paywalled um, and published by Elsevier, so we don't actually include it as part of this MOOC because all the content we, uh, which we link to and which we create is open. For a sort of different view on this, if you look at the EU-funded project FOSTER, they define open science as the movement to make scientific research, data, and dissemination accessible to all levels of an inquiring society. So with this, open science can probably be viewed broadly as a way of enhancing the scientific progress through sharing of knowledge and methods, wider collaboration, and increased rigor. And as well as this is indirectly already sort of postulated to be part of um, our own uh, collective core values and good scientific practices. You know, the whole idea is that research can only thrive if it is shared and built upon, um, you know, in the open. Perhaps a, a good way of distilling this, though, is that often the usage of open science seems to be based around three core things. Um, so these are processes such as, you know, collaboration or reproducibility, um, products, things like open data, open materials and open access, as well as values such as freedom and equity. Um, together, these things form, uh, seem to form a sort of chain reaction and positive feedback loop where values drive a particular process, which in turn scopes the products of your research. So touching upon this, this concept of, um, of community values within open science, again, like the values which are inherent to what we call open science have not really been rigorously defined or accepted by the global research community. However, um, there are a number of inherent values that come up time and time again in discussions of openness. And this includes things such as diversity, inclusivity, fairness, equity, social behavior, accountability, ethics, and responsibility. Now, hopefully what jumps out to you is that these aren't necessarily values that are exclusive to scientific research, and they're more human in nature. Um, this is critical, really, as it helps to frame open science as an inherently human nature and thus amplify its social importance and imperative. There's a great quote by Alex uh, Lancaster on, on this, and he says, how do we use open science approaches in the context of retooling our institutions to benefit actual living and breathing humans, including scientists and non-scientists? How can we use open science to enable as many people who have the interest and talent to pursue science for its own sake and to generate knowledge that is broadly useful for society and not just elite institutions venture capital firms or global mega corporations. Another sort of related uh, quote, favorite quote of mine is from um, the famous researcher Stephen Gould and he said once, I am somehow less interested in the weight and convolutions of Einstein's brain than in the near certainty that people of equal talent have lived and died in cotton fields and sweatshops. Um, so yes, the, these values um, around things like di diversity and inclusivity. What we made sure from the beginning is to sort of try and embed these principles as much as possible within the mission and the goals of the open science community. So if you take these things and then apply it to, to research, you know, some of the key value-based goals of the open science community uh, emerge from this. And they include things such as um, 
freely available access to all outputs of the entire research process, uh, equity and inclusive participation in research, diverse and creative interpretation of scientific results, um, having rigorous, transparent and responsible evaluation of research processes and outcomes, um, the collaborative reuse of research outcomes, reducing cost, waste and redundancy, uh, comprehensive research practices incentivized through more diverse reward systems, having accelerated research discovery, innovation and public impact, and finally perhaps in increasing the reproducibility of research results, which in turn helps to enhance their trustability and integrity. So if we believe in all of these values and all of these principles and sort of practices, then what we have to ask of ourselves uh, realistically is why is an all publicly funded science practice this way? And this uh, sort of emphasizes a key tension in the space. What we seem to be doing, I think, as a community is um, communicating that open science is an alternative to many modern or traditional scientific methods. Um, what we want to argue here is that open science is not this, and in fact, what it is, is an enhancement of the traditional process, using new knowledge, new skills and technologies to improve how the process and outputs of research are communicated. And again, like we can embed this around fundamental human values, around inclusivity, freedom and equity um, upon foundational elements to the research process, rather than sort of attaching them as an afterthought. And for us, these human values are what really distinguish open science from much of the way that modern research is viewed and practiced. We also believe that virtually everyone who comes into the space, into the open science community, already has these fundamental values as part of who they are. Um, however, often, you know, the issue is that these, these values can become divergent in the way in which the academic system often forces us to work. And one of the goals of the open science movement is to change that and to realign the way science is practiced with these core human values. So I'm sure what we all know is that the foundational elements of most traditional research communication are peer-reviewed articles. And these act as an important mechanism to summarize and communicate our research. Um, open science is about helping to make these research articles more rigorous, more verifiable, and more reliable as well at the same time. So ultimately, this could help to enhance public trust in the scientific community and endeavor. And in a modern day society, this has really never been more important. A great quote from uh, Michael Wolfel et al. Uh, in 2011 said that, in fact, open science is subject to the most rigorous peer review because the process never ends. Um, with this, perhaps one of the most important aspects of the open science movement or community in recent years has been this uh, huge drive behind the liberation of research papers from behind paywalls in order to make them freely available to everyone. And this is widely known as open access. So open access um, is fundamentally based on the principle that all humans uh, deserve to have access to scientific knowledge and to benefit from the results of that. However, still today in 2018, uh, towards the end of 2018 when we're recording this, uh, most research papers still remain locked behind expensive paywalls and thus um, inaccessible to most people on this planet. Um, critical research data remains hidden away on hard drives, methods often remain scantily documented, and research results often cannot be reproduced. And we, we have this bizarre system in which researchers are often evaluated based on seemingly senseless criteria such as the journal impact factor. Um, these are just some of the examples of typical practices that contribute to what might be viewed as, as close science or even um, bad or unethical scientific practices. Now, open science comes into this because um, no matter how you define open science, it typically revolves around changing these research practices through some sort of cultural or paradigm shift. Um, this shift in research culture is often also referred to as the scholarly commons, which seeks to explore and redefine what a modern scholarly communication ecosystem should look like. Now, accomplishing a cultural shift like this on a global scale is not easy. Um, fundamentally, it's usually mainly done through the spread of shared cultural norms and values that are interpreted and celebrated in hundreds of local institutions, you know, be it your research department, your school, your lab, university, even your professional learned society or association, uh, through publishing efforts, open software platforms and development companies, or even funding agencies. Um, 
you know, it's a complex and multidimensional paradigm to even attempt to comprehend. So each of these sort of organizations fits itself into the cultural practices that members decide will work best for them to become active in performing the cultural work of open science. Um, with this, what hopefully becomes clear is that cultural change must start from the ground up, and open science principles help to illuminate this ground. So the power of modern web technologies enables instantaneous sharing and global collaboration in a reasonably unrestricted fashion. Uh, the digital era is transforming the way in which research is performed, and the limitations of distribution from the print era are largely gone, you know, at least in, in theory. With this, um, new issues definitely arise, including the complexities of knowledge capture and communication. Uh, the framing of these complexities as a commons really helps to integrate the political, social, economic, and philosophical dimensions around knowledge generation and sharing. What open science here does, then, is give rise to a new set of standards, tools, principles, and practices, all to help revolutionize the way in which we perform and disseminate knowledge. And really, we're going to need all of this if we want to help shape, uh, shape our world for the better. For example, uh, the United Nations recently set a number of critical sustainable development goals. These include things such as good health and well-being, uh, eliminating uh, world hunger, gender equality, providing quality education, taking action on climate change, taking, life, uh, taking action to preserve life both in the sea and on land. And um, the question, you know, which, which I always like to ask on this is, do you believe that science can help us progress towards re uh, reaching these goals? Now, hopefully your answer is a resounding yes, but then if you, uh, if you do believe that science can help us, you know, save, save this planet in a way, um, you must also acknowledge that much of the way in which we often currently practice science in this, you know, sort of closed manner means that we're not doing the best that we can to achieve this. So, you know, more widely, open science then can be seen as a cultural shift that helps to make the world a better place. So <laughs> now that we've sort of set that lofty goal in place, um, let's go back in time and look a bit at the history of open science and open cultures. So in the 1660s, Robert Boyle, or the father of chemistry, broke with the practices of alchemy in his early writings, um, like The Skeptical Chemist, and promoted open experimentation following uh, a, a model proposed by Roger Bacon. So previously, alchemists occulted their methods and their knowledge died with them. What might have been called open alchemy became natural philosophy and then ultimately science, and science was sort of born in this intrinsically open fashion. With this, there became sort of many intersections between open science and different aspects of an open culture, um, you know, including really diverse uh, aspects such as, you know, open business, open technology, open infrastructure. Um, open creation, even like things like heritage, uh, legal and governance structures, and education systems, all of these things create an open culture which open science in some way intersects with. So this commitment to opening science to help it make it more transparent and accessible, it really is nothing new. For some historians of science, openness even marks the beginning of science itself. For example, with the printing press, the rise of publication markets and empirical methods in the early modern period came both the professionalization of scientists and the institutionalization of academies. The earliest forms, though, of open science can perhaps trace their origins back to the 17th century and the origins of the academic journals, such as the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society. What transactions did was collect and disseminate a broad range of observations and experiment descriptions and help to spread the work of what was then the Invisible College, the informal gathering of natural philosophers at Oxford and elsewhere. Publication of scientific news here was also catalyzed by an increasing demand for the wider dissemination of scientific knowledge with the wider public. However, the origins can probably go back even further to the very birth of scholarly practices. You know, much of what we know about our world and universe has foundations in fundamental openness, from evolution and the origin of the species, through to gravity and the origin of stars. Although difficult to pin down exactly, the origins of what many now call the, the modern open science movement were probably catalyzed by an increasing frustration and debate and distress regarding the impacts of what many people call closed science, and this includes um, barriers such as subscription paywalls. Um, as well as the commercialization of knowledge and dissemination by corporate publishers. Indeed, um, 
one of the rallying cries of the open science movement is that taxpayers who have already paid to fund research should not be having to pay again to read the results of it. So the term open science itself seems to have been coined um, back by Steve Mann in 1998, although again the exact origins are a little bit unknown. So today's open science movement though probably dates back about 30 or 40 years and takes inspiration from the history of open source and the free software movement and the ideas developed for research collaboration in the context around e-science. At a first glance, these approaches refer mainly to the technological dimensions of opening up science by creating necessary tools and infrastructures. Opening up science, then, often takes on the form of a technological liberation and change in techniques in respective discourses. However, keeping in mind that scientific technology are politics by any other means, offering other means of power, that is, it is vital to turn to the embedded politics of open science and its precursors. In the last two decades, there's been a really explosive growth in the development of different aspects of scholarly infrastructure, um, and by this we mean the core underpinning aspects of a well-functioning research machine. Much of this is a blend of non-profit and commercial services, which are now variably integrated, but has created a really strange and complex new system of ways to perform and communicate research. It is difficult here, though, to cast judgment on for-profit versus not-for-profit entities with respect to openness in a very simple binary way. For example, you know, it's very easy to argue that for-profit entities such as Publons and Figshare were important in catalyzing changes in crediting peer review as well as open data, respectively. Um, whereas we have other not-for-profits or charities, such as the American Chemical Society, who have actively lobbied against progressive changes around open science. So just from this sort of brief introduction, what might hopefully be coming a little more clear is that open science is really about systematic change. It challenges the way research is conducted at a practical and a cultural level. As well as this, it addresses the way in which research is evaluated and the ways in which scientific knowledge is disseminated and integrated into the functioning of a modern society. Much of this is ingrained into research cultures through self-reinforcing local governance systems, which are often imposed through external capitalist pressures. For example, the publish or perish mantra is a direct consequence of these pressures, which in turn is linked to the evolving neoliberal agenda imposed by many modern research institutes. So now, if this sort of makes sense to you, it might seem like open science is in almost direct conflict with the capitalist culture. Now, this conflict is not new to science, though. In the 1940s, the famed sociologist Robert Merton articulated some of the results of his sociology of science research to, as a set of four norms. Uh, these norms were principles that describe the underlying ethos of science. Each of these norms is sharply divergent to how a free marketplace operates. One of Merton's norms was communism, although this is often reworded as communalism. He described this as the non-technical and extended sense of common ownership of goods and as a second integral element of the scientific ethos. Um, he said the substantive findings of science are a product of social collaboration and are assigned to the community. They constitute a, a common heritage in which the equity of the individual producer is severely limited. So as well as this, the other three norms included universalism, disinterestedness and organized skepticism. Universalism is the, the norm describing that researchers should be concerned with the content of claims and not just who, with who made them. Disinterestedness describes the norm that researchers are typically in this for more than just personal gain. And organized skepticism describes the, uh, the norm where anyone can potentially advance knowledge claims. It is good here to remember that open science principles rearticulate science norms that were historically con then considered to be integral to research itself. Open science reaffirms the right of the community to access the substantive findings of research. As these findings of research belong to the entire community, any attempt by individuals or corporations to capture these for profit is a practice based on notion of equity that is foreign to and contrary to how a research is meant to operate. More recently though, open science really hit the mainstream around 2016 due to a number of possible reasons. There was a great combination of political activity and grassroots community-led initiatives, and they helped to put open science firmly on the map. Now, almost everywhere you go in research, uh, openness is all around us in one way or another. However, what we know is that the production of research knowledge is inherently geopolitical, as emphasized by the great work done by the Knowledge Gap team. 
there are strange forces at play that influence representation, mechanisms of distribution, dimensions of power, and structural ino inequalities throughout the entire global scholarly communication system. These will contribute towards a very complex and fragmented global o open science landscape. To quote Denise Albanos on this, she says, to see open science as a historically produced discourse, we need to first abandon the notion that openness is always inherently positive and or neutral. We then need to revise and contextualize openness within their particular historical legacies, contexts, and socio-political struggles. Now, this is really important for sort of framing, um, you know, the open science movement, community, and history. Um, more recently, you know, what we're seeing is that there's been a strong focus on open science in, in the last few years in Europe. We have one of the biggest developments coming from this being the building of the European Open Science Cloud. Uh, outside of Europe, there have been strong recent developments across Africa with the development of the African Open Science Platform, as well as other places around Asia, including Indonesia. In October 2018 as well, a large group of individuals and organizations across Latin America signed the Open Science Panama Declaration, emphasizing that open science really has spread across the global research landscape. Through all of this, though, researchers and those engaged with the wider open science community must make sure to be aware of the geopolitical dimensions around open science and knowledge production. So, as we mentioned above, there doesn't seem to be really a single accepted definition of what open science is. Um, ask one person and they'll tell you it's about making datasets and research papers more public. Ask another and they'll tell you it's about a vision for a radical transformation of scholarship where all processes and outputs are instantaneously public. The extent to which different communities and disciplines have embraced and adopted open science practices is extremely variable. However, what hopefully is becoming more clear is that open science in one form or another is taking, across, uh, taking off across the entire research domain, from the arts and humanities through to so social sciences, maths, engineering, and physical sciences. So there are two possible ways to perhaps look at this. Firstly, some might argue that the power of a definition lies in its precision, and helps to avoid distortion of these definitions, what some might call in this case open washing. But secondly, flexibility in the definition and its understanding and interpretation lead to increased familiarity with the concept as what's known as a boundary object. For the latter and for open science, this means that while it might be interpreted differently across different communities with a variety of norms and practices, the foundational understanding that open science is good for public access to knowledge is universally accepted. However, there are also geopolitical differences that shape our understanding of open science. For example, in Europe and much of the industrial world, open science often has an inherently market-oriented language that promotes economic value, productivity, and competition above all other factors. However, for many of those in what's sometimes called the global south, open science is more about fostering community building through knowledge sharing and nurturing social networks around new technologies and infrastructures. So building on a civic culture of sharing, open science creates new value from what you might call every object, including ideas, data, methods, software, and results. Um, every object that is openly shared, releasing the inherent value of the entire research process. Some of this new value accrues to the researcher who shares. Some of it goes to the benefit of all researchers working in the same area who reuse these objects and some goes to researchers who can open up new research from the collective resource that these objects now enhance. The last value is the ultimate promise of open science, a shared surplus of research objects that can be openly mixed, mined, and melded into new synthetic knowledge. In 2016, Aaron McKeon and colleagues published a really great paper in eLife that helped to demonstrate the advantages of open sharing for increasing citations, impact, and ultimately the careers of researchers. What the open researcher does to increase the holdings of the open corpus in their field adds a civic choice to these advantages. Growing the open research ecosystem helps every researcher on the planet while simultaneously making a conscious objective towards making research a public and societal good. Thus, even within traditional systems of research evaluation, the practices of open science are inherently beneficial to the individual. Adding new research findings or experimental methods to an open repository or platform actually tends to be easy or easier than sharing within a closed collection, such as with a for-profit publisher. Open sharing scales better, particularly when it uses open standards-based platforms, such as the Open Science Framework. It also tends to be less fragile, since it can be migrated or ported into new platforms and spread across multiple locations. 
openness then as for discoverability and access and contributes to reproducibility. But really, the potential of openness is virtually unlimited in scope. Even as the value of, you know, say for example, a telephone exchange increases with each new telephone connection, the addition of a new data set or a null result paper or a specific finding builds numerous interconnections with the rest of the global research corpus. These interconnections and their network effects can lead to the generation of new knowledge, and they can serve as a mirror and a measure to reveal how each new bit of content solves or critiques a specific issue, and also potential problems with a newly added object. Rapid open peer review opportunities arise, as well as increased recognition and opportunities for new collaborations. Now, many of these network effects will really take place on the internet, and thus at a planetary scale. The interconnections made possible by open science build capacity for the free movement of objects and ideas directly linked back to their authors. This capacity for the almost instant and free global access to research products on the open web is anathema to markets that need to claim ownership and restrict access in order to capture the profits from these. Distributed data protocols, such as the interplanetary file system and other emergent technologies will help to reduce the cost of hosting science objects to a near zero margin. Open licenses will also make sharing research knowledge durable and its reuse legal. As Cameron Nalon said at the metrics breakout of the Beyond the PDF conference in 2011, reuse is THE metric. Well, why is this? Reuse reveals and confirms the advantage that open sharing has over many current market-based practices. It also helps to validate the work of the researcher who contributed to the research ecosystem, and it captures more of the inherent value of the original discovery and helps to accelerate knowledge growth. So open science, then, is a research knowledge and data reuse accelerator. Its network effects help make reuse available and, in time, inevitable. However, active open reuse has not been a part of the scientific culture for many scientists today, and the cultural changes that can help open science to realise the goal of widespread reuse is a major challenge that we face. Of note here is that much of what we're discussing has only recently become possible due to the rapid advances in web-based technologies. This doesn't therefore mean that much historical research was not open science, it just means that the opportunities simply weren't available to researchers back then. So, with this sort of uh, context in mind, it's time now to finally move on to the principles of open science. Now, what we want to make clear is that there are really no rules about open science, and no one individual or organisation is setting the agenda here. However, what is becoming more commonly recognised is that open science is underpinned by specific core principles and values. In recognition of this, there are now more than a hundred charters and declarations, all to do with data sharing and scholarly communication and publishing, and hundreds more advocacy organisations that make openness a significant part of their mission. In 2017, Tony Ross Hallower tried to outline what the principles of open scholarship were, and they included things such as transparency, accountability, inclusivity, public good, equality, accessibility, findability and reproducibility, as well as other things. So, what we want to note here is that often you will find things that describe themselves as open science, but they really don't seem to embrace these principles. These things are often probably not true open science, and it's what we call uh, open washing. And what they are are just attempts to surf the wave or join the, the sort of open science bandwagon, if you will, but as a PR stunt. The opposite is also true then, that many researchers might actually practice openness, but simply choose not to refer it to as this, or are perhaps unaware of the relationship. One key organisation in this space has been OCSDNet, the Open and Collaborative Science and Development Network. They released a fantastic video that helps to frame the principles of open science. It outlines the importance of representation and inclusivity within open science, and the importance of these in challenging the core values of traditional or modern science. What they did was propose seven principles for open and collaborative science. Principle one was about enabling a knowledge columns where every individual has the means to decide how their knowledge is governed and manage to address their needs. Principle two, it recognizes cognitive justice, the need for diverse understandings of knowledge making to coexist in scientific production. Principle three, it practices situated openness by addressing the ways in which context, power and inequality condition scientific research. Principle four, it advocates for every individual's right to research and enables different forms of participation at all stages of the research process. Principle five, it fosters equitable collaboration between scientists and social actors and cultivates co-creation and social innovation in society. Principle six, 
It incentivizes inclusive infrastructures that empower people of all abilities to make and use accessible open source technologies. And finally, principle seven, it strives to use knowledge as a pathway to sustainable development, equipping every individual to improve the well-being of our society and planet. So what might be emerging from all of this is that open science consists of a lot of different dimensions. Um, open science, just like regular science, is a very complicated construct. But thankfully, a lot of really, really great work has already been performed to help frame the different contexts of open science. One of the most uh, commonly used is the open science ta taxonomy uh, developed by Nancy Pontica and, and colleagues for, for FOSTER. The different aspects of this open science taxonomy will be explored throughout the different modules in the MOOC, but really we want to just highlight here just some of the core concepts. These include things like open data, which is about the process of sharing both the original, raw, and the treated or processed data online. This helps others to redo your experiments and to reuse it for additional purposes, helping to verify and accelerate research discoveries. Open access allows anyone to access and reuse research published in journal articles without payment or restriction. Open peer review in itself is a very highly dimensional concept and includes aspects to do with publishing review reports, revealing the identities of reviewers, or making peer review a more continuous and collaborative process. Open methods refers to the process of the research being well documented in sufficient detail to allow others to help repeat, reproduce, or replicate the research. And finally, there's open source. Much modern research relies on code and software, and open source is about providing free access and reuse rights to maximize its utility. Other critical aspects of open science include things like public engagement with science, open educational resources, and open advocacy, all of which will be covered in later modules within this MOOC. Another popular framing device is the Open Science Schools of Thought by Benedict Fecher and Zasia Frieseke. This includes the Infrastructure School, which is concerned with how the architecture of new technologies can help to make a more efficient research enterprise. The Public School regards the accessibility of knowledge creation to a wider audience. The Measurement School is concerned with alternative methods of assessing scientific impact development. The democratic school is based around fundamental rights of access to knowledge. And finally, the pragmatic school is concerning the role of collaborative research for more efficient knowledge creation and dissemination. Recently, the foundations for open scholarship strategy development added a sixth school to this, the community and inclusion school, which is concerned with ensuring a diverse and inclusive community within the open scholarship space. So bearing this very long introduction to open science in mind, let's now talk about how open science impacts you. The most comprehensive overview of how open science impacts individuals comes from Eric McKinnon et al. in the paper we mentioned before. This is entitled, How Open Science Re Helps Researchers Succeed. Now, there's not much more point in rehashing this here, as it does such a good job of making a very positive case based on a number of dimensions already. However, just from the abstract, we can really see the importance of open science. It says, open access, open data, and open source, and other open scholarship practices are growing in popularity and necessity. However, widespread adoption of these practices has not yet been achieved. One reason is that researchers are uncertain about how sharing their work will affect their careers. We review literature demonstrating that open research is associated with increases in citations, media attention, potential collaborators, job opportunities, and funding opportunities. These findings are evidence that open research practices bring significant benefits to researchers relative to more traditional closed practices. Perhaps one of the most well-documented examples of this is what's called the open access citation advantage. This describes the cross-field phenomenon where if you publish your research open access, you are likely to get more citations than if you published your work closed access. This sort of just makes sense because if more people can read and access your research, then more people can cite it. What we really have to consider in this context are ongoing changes in research evaluation. So the world of research evaluation is constantly changing. The way in which researchers and their research is assessed governs virtually everything, as this defines the motivation and incentives behind certain practices and behaviours. Typically, the venue of publication and the journal and its impact factor have been considered to be of critical importance in assessing both researchers and the research itself. However, in the last five years or so, there's been a surge in uprising against this practice. As Stephen Curry noted in 2012, he said, So consider all that we know of impact factors and think on this. If you use impact factors, you are statistically illiterate. He went on to say, If you include journal impact factors in the list of publications in your CV, you are statistically illiterate. 
if you are judging grant or promotion applications and find yourself scanning the applicant's publications, checking off the impact factors, you are statistically illiterate. If you publish a journal that trumpets its impact factor in adverts or emails, you are statistically illiterate. If you trumpet the impact factor to three decimal places, there is little hope for you. And finally, he said, if you see someone else using impact factors and make no attempt at correction, you connive at statistical illiteracy. So, while there is generally little empirical evidence, actually, it is generally accepted that research evaluation is almost entirely contingent on getting research articles published in high-impact journal venues. Strangely, very little actual empirical evidence, though, exists to demonstrate that this view is embedded in practice. For example, a recent study from Juan Pablo Alperin and colleagues analyzed the review, tenure, and promotion guidelines from across a wide range of North American research institutes. What they found was that about 48% of research institutes mentioned metrics of some sort in these documents, but with variations across different institute types. One consequence of this is that other elements of the research process are often seen as less important. This often includes practices that we associate with open science and forms of wider public engagement, which can be viewed as risky or detrimental to the career choices of individual researchers. In particular, those who are already perhaps disadvantaged or marginalised, or at an earlier stage in their career. Now, if you think about it, this actually makes complete sense. Researchers, you know, believe it or not, are human. Thus, we are driven by the inherent human desires to do things like pay our rent, eat food, pay our bills, and provide for our families. And in order to do this, we have to keep our jobs. Usually, this means conforming, then, to how we believe we will be assessed. And any external pressures to this is seen as a risk to our livelihoods. This is why, as we discussed above, presenting open science as divergent from traditional research processes, as opposed to something that enhances or benefits the, way, the ways of doing things, can actually be inadvertently damaging. Perhaps, though, a much bigger consequence of this is that we essentially have a system where researchers are rewarded for how many papers they publish and the brands associated with the venue of publication, which can be detrimental to the value of shared knowledge. For example, a lot of research has now shown that using the journal rank for research assessment is an inherently bad scientific practice, and indeed such a negative impact on research that scholarly journals should perhaps be abandoned altogether. Further research has also shown that journal rank is associated with decreased methodological quality and research reliability, and that the present system of journal hierarchies is an ongoing threat to the entire research ecosystem. These issues and criticisms have led to an increasing debate around and action against modern research evaluation systems. One of the most significant steps was the development of what's called the Leiden Manifesto, which produced 10 simple principles to improve the measurement of research performance and is currently available in 20 different languages. Another important step in research evaluation reform was the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment, often just shortened to DORA. Similarly to the Leiden Manifesto, DORA seeks to improve how research is assessed and individuals and organizations can sign the declaration to show their support. The Open Science MOOC has, of course, signed. So, with all of this in mind, it's worth considering the, the potential impact that open science can have on your career. Now, what we know is that things are changing. It's becoming much more widely realized that publication-based incentives are detrimental to the research process and the health of a research culture. For example, a recent advertisement for a professorship at the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich is one of the first times that open science was made an explicit part of hiring criteria. It said, our department embraces the values of open science and strives for replicable and reproducible research. For this goal, we support transparent research with open data, open material, and pre-registrations. Candidates are asked to describe in what way they already pursue and plan to pursue these goals. Therefore, having open science like this as a core value in research department sends a strong message for a shift in research cultures. More and more universities all the time are including aspects of open scholarship in their promotion and tenure guidelines, including Virginia Commonwealth University, the University of North Texas, the Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, as well as Purdue Indi University Indianapolis, and a whole range more. Another thing that researchers like to have, apparently, in order to carry out their work, is funding. Again, open practices are becoming much more widely recognized in the funding application process and can even help to give researchers an edge or the ability to qualify for special funds. Such funders include the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the National Science Foundation of the United States, 
the NIH, as well in the US, the European Commission, the UK's Wellcome Trust, as well as the Shuttleworth Foundation, which also partially supported the development of this MOOC. So, despite these more or less perhaps obvious benefits of open scientific practices, there are also a range of reasonable concerns and therefore necessary limitations and exceptions to be identified, discussed, and implemented in a highly discipline-specific manner. It would actually be utterly foolish and not very scientific of us to rampantly support open science without paying due consideration to some of these concerns. Some of these include, but are not limited to, the release of personal data and information about individuals, publication of any sensitive information, such as bioengineering or medical information, the geomapping data for endangered species, uh, poor formatting of data for reuse, lack of distributed article processing charge funding, the use of proprietary software, financial paywalls often imposed by publishers, complex, confusing, and difficult to navigate embargo periods, conflicts between funder and publisher policies, uh, usage restrictions imposed by publishers, as well as a reluctance to publish due to fear of competition. Another important aspect to note, as has always been, is that each openly released data set requires a clear description of the context in which data was raised, such as the metadata. This helps researchers who make use of the freely accessible data apply it in a meaningful analysis and reasonably transfer context. Many of these are discussed further within the Foundations for Open Scholarship Strategy Development. So open science really reflects the intentions of the researchers themselves, and is thereby subject to cultural bias. Open science is not a perfect system by any means, and operates a hierarchy between different barriers. For example, open access seeks to remove barriers such as price for re readers and reuse permissions, but often fails to address barriers such as connectivity or language, and also in some cases even erect new barriers such as author-facing costs. Now, this is something which the open science movement in general is becoming more and more aware of, especially regarding the risks and impacts that progress towards open science can have, particularly on marginalized demographics or already higher risk communities. Some of the major barriers towards open science include things like forcing junior researchers to share their data at the, the point of first publication, potentially compromising their future research based on those data. Also, high article processing charges or APCs for publication discriminate against those without financial privilege. There are other geopolitical factors, including resistance to sharing data due to fear of persecution or knowledge misuse and appropriation. And as well as this, the biggest barrier perhaps is evidence. Researchers can be a little bit conservative sometimes towards adoption of new approaches until there is sufficient evidence that these new approaches are superior than traditional methods. But as well as these issues, there are several worrying and ongoing trends that reflect more systemic issues within open science and open scholarship more generally. These issues include the fact that open science now seems to be introducing more metrics to incentivize researchers to work harder at the cost of true productivity and creativity, and is not really always in their best interests. We also have new gatekeepers that seem to be consolidating these metrics and using them to define the future of research, while ending up with a system operating that's much more like a business than any sort of exploratory venture. What we're also seeing is the increasing capture of research and infrastructure by commercial for-profit entities, reflecting the increasingly neoliberal market organisation around science and higher education. These same entities actually all often end up having a parasitic relationship with researchers and provide the labor, the services, and content for free in order to help these corporations build profits. There also seems to be a lack of job stability and security, as well as resources, which acts against innovation or any form of risk-taking. There also often seems to be a lack of consideration of the social and cultural real-world benefits of research, and the ongoing fact that most historical research that's been published still remains locked away from access or reuse. Based on this, it might be interesting to ask why such dangerous trends seem to grow from seemingly good intentions based on positive core principles and values. Based on some of this, it might even be easy to become extremely pessimistic or even antagonistic towards whatever open science is. However, as with any movement or any new way of doing things, it's really down to each of us to carefully balance the potential drawbacks and benefits and the wider consequences and context of these. While the core principles underlying open science are often focused on accessibility, in practice there is often a trade-off within this hierarchy, and often with unforeseen consequences. Much of this is not really due to the intentions of open science, but more about difficulties in reconciling with different stakeholder viewpoints, which often leads to inherent conflict and complications around developments. 
It's perfectly natural then for researchers and industries that have made themselves successful or profitable based on a particular set of practices to resist any disruption towards that. For example, imagine if you're a researcher who has built a very successful career and to some or even a large extent based on the journals in which you've published your work. Then imagine someone comes across and says, journal brands, impact factors, and journal ranks are actually really bad for science and don't tell us much about the quality of your work. There's a small chance that you might end up resisting that a little bit. Now, as well as this, imagine if you're a commercial publisher. Selling your brand to libraries, funders, research assessment groups, and researchers is critical for the financial sustainability and integrity of your journal. Simply removing all concept of branding from your you know, journals is not exactly a really good path towards f uh, financial sustainability. And we do see these tensions still arising within this space. Earlier this year, Springer Nature launched their public IPO. Within there, there was a statement which said, We also aim at increasing our article processing charges by increasing the value we offer to authors through improving the impact factor and reputation of our existing journals. Now, depending on how you look at this, this might not sound like a company who has the best interests of researchers, the public, and open science at heart, yet these are one of the biggest players in this space. So there are major tensions here that reflect inherent power dynamics within the scholarly communication system, which perhaps explains why it might have been so difficult to move away from an impact factor or journal-dominated system since the advent of open science. Another tension in this space is about moving away from a subscription model to one where all published scholarly research is freely available. So, did you know that back in 2007, publishers such as Elsevier, Wiley, and the American Chemical Society were advised by someone nicknamed the Pitbull of Public Relations to equate public and open access with government censorship and for traditional subscription-based publishing with peer review? This represents just one small part of a long history where some actors within the scholarly publishing industry have actively lobbied against and even ran smear campaigns against open science as a delay tactic until they can find a way to either completely destroy it or convert it into a profitable business model. This resistance perhaps is one of the key factors in explaining why, in about 20 years of relentless campaigning, the global research community has actually only managed to make about 25% of the world's research openly accessible, with the rest still locked behind expensive paywalls. Another key element to discuss here is the intersection and overlap between open science and reproducible research. Now, traditionally, much of the research process, as well as the outputs, can remain hidden or closed from public scrutiny. One of the main things about open science is that it attempts to expose some of this process. For example, by recording and documenting what we might call failed reactions, highlighting repeated experiments and their variants, and revealing the thoughts, ideas, and comments that were part of the process, but didn't make it into a final research paper. It might help to imagine open science practices of having a sort of magnifying glass or webcam pointing at your research all the time. This helps to expose the, the process increase care and lead to a well-documented process that others can copy and replicate if needed. Now, this is an inherently social process, but comes with a really important consideration, and that's the acknowledgement that research is not a perfect process. Now, <laughs> this might be difficult to accept for many of us, typically um, because the way in which we read about research papers or in the media is usually based around just the positive aspects, with all of the sort of nitty-gritty bits hidden from public view. We all know that research is imperfect, and we should learn to embrace and communicate failure as an inherent part of that process. All of these elements can be documented as part of what's often called a lab notebook, and comes with an important implication. The aspects of research that did not produce favorable results are just as important as those which do. Here, the intersection of reproducibility and open science becomes centered around one core value that we discussed earlier, which is freedom and liberation. A recent study by Frankenhui and Nettle described the practices of open science as being liberating to individuals. This was because they enable transparent and comfortable exploration of data. They reward quality, which puts us under control, rather than outcomes, which are not under our control. Open science helps to reduce the demand for positive results required for career advancement, and cultivates a flexible and open mindset. It also helps to enable a more constructive and collaborative research climate and generates more accurate information that is ultimately more accessible. Therefore, one could easily argue that open science is aligned with concepts of academic freedom by liberating individuals from the constraints of the closed system.
We'll discuss the links between open science and reproducible research more in module three. All right, we're nearly at the end now. What we want to discuss briefly is how to make open science part of your daily research workflow. Hopefully, what you might now see is that open science impacts almost every aspect of your typical research workflow. We all think and have ideas and gather data and analyze it, and we usually want to share the results of all of this with virtually anyone who will listen and reuse what we've done. Now, there are a number of tools, services, and platforms and practices for everyone to engage with, and this will likely differ for each individual lab group or research community. Now, like we said before, there are no set rules. Open Science gives you the freedom to explore processes that work best for you, your research, and the impact that this can have on your wider community. There are now hundreds of potential examples and combinations of tools that can help to make your research workflow all the way, uh, more open all the way from something like an initial grant proposal through to research assessment. Throughout the rest of this MOOC, what you'll do hopefully is meet many of these on your little open science adventure and be able to tailor all of these new knowledge and skills to suit you, what is best for you. Hopefully now you've come to see the importance of open science as a fundal, fundamental part of modern research. Open science can be seen as an umbrella term for a range of ideals, values, practices and principles, all of which are integrated together. Hopefully, after this little module, there should be several things which you've learned. Hopefully, you can now describe some of the ethical, social, cultural and research impact arguments for and against open science. After deciding maybe which platforms, tools and services are most useful for you and your community, you'll also be able to develop a personal profile for showcasing your own and others' research profiles and outputs. As well as this, after reflecting on the status for open science within your research group or lab, hopefully now you'll be able to devise concrete ways to locally improve open practices. Using the guidelines published by your own research labs, departments or institutes, you'll hopefully now also be able to identify the practices and policies for career progress and, ass and assessment, publishing and open access and data sharing. Finally, you'll also be able to further collaborate with colleagues and international peers to develop a shared definition of open science. There are a couple of tasks associated with this MOOC that should help with all of these. From these, what you will hopefully now have are the foundational best practices and knowledge needed to engage in open science. Some small, tangible steps that you can take from here to make a real difference include just to make sure that when you can, to cite existing public data and also to reuse it. When you can, make sure you're also sharing your research data through a trusted online repository. Make sure as well to release all the source code and scripts used for your analyses, including the environment and dependencies needed to run them. Make sure as well that you're posting free copies of your research articles online, however is possible to you and without risk of legal uh, retribution. Share preprints of your articles online as well, ideally at the time of journal submission. And if you can, choose an open access journal to publish your research articles. These little recommendations are drawn from a great paper called Do You Speak Open Science? Resources and Tips to Learn the Language by Paola Masuso and Leonard Martins. Together, they just scratch the surface of the full power of open science. But to learn more about this, well, you have to visit the remaining nine modules. This is the perfect chance for individuals such as yourself now to take action and seize the initiative to become a champion in your research field. To finish it off with a quote from Mick Watson, he said back in 2015, open science is the future and it will replace closed science. I encourage you to embrace it. As well as this MOOC, we have plenty of further reading for you. There's so much out there on this topic that it would take years of continuous reading to get through it all. So we've selected some of our favorite research articles on, on the topic of open science to help you go a little bit deeper or to provide a great overview of much of what we've discussed here. All of the content that we link to is of course free to access and reuse. Our development team here, Gareth O'Neill, Bruce Caron and Joe Haverman for their fantastic work in getting this done. As well as this, within the rest of the MOOC, there are a range of additional tools and services that can help you on your own little open science journey, and you can even help to edit the content of this MOOC itself. Finally, thank you all for listening, and we hope that you enjoy the rest of this content. Nope.